So, Ted, you ready to talk about the new book? Didn't we already discuss everything? Uh, what are you talking about, man? Tasha's Cauldron just came out. But it's about everything? Didn't Xanathar cover it? Oh, God, Ted. Enough with the bad jokes already. Let's just do an overview of Tasha's Cauldron to everything. Welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds, by Nerds. I'm Nerdarchy Steve, and as usual, I'm joined by this nerd. Nerdarchy is Ted. Hey, if you want to mix up some D&D videos in your own YouTube cauldron, then you should click that subscribe button. And if you're looking for more Nerdarchy and don't want to miss everything, then you just might want to ring that notification bell. All right, before we jump into this video, it's only fair to mention that you can pick this up from our sponsor, D&D Beyond, and add it to your digital collection over there. It's part of the legendary bundle. You grab a discount, get it, get it individual, buy stuff a la carte. But if you're more of a dead tree kind of person, you can head over to Amazon and grab it there. All right, so Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has got quite a lot of information in it. And it really dives into, you know, trying to customize and create the character that you're really looking for. And chapter one starts off right with that. Yeah, chapter one, we're going to start with basically your your origin, which your origin is essentially your race, your D&D race. And it gives you a bunch of different ways to mix and match and change things up. I mean, it's already been floating around the Internet. You've probably seen it. You can put your stats kind of where you, you want them and adjust them how you want. You can trade out skills and proficiencies, you know, for different things. Like there's a chart that tells you how you can do it as well as languages. Uh, and they're the main things that you're going to be able to switch up and change to, I don't know, build the character that you always wanted to play. Yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, they say, well, you know, if you're an elf and, you know, your skills that you're taught are, you know, cultural, well, what if you grew up outside of your culture? So giving that customization option for your stats, for your skills, really allows you to, you know, truly make your character unique. And, you know, with that flair, that can allow you to really pick and choose with your DM's permission, you know, the ability to be like, I, I want to play something that is so against type and actually still mechanically support that. Yeah, we have like a whole train of thought on what they do there. This video is just an overview. We're going to probably get into that specifically in a different video. It also gives you a way to rechange your skills. Maybe you pick something. It's not as useful as you thought. It's not coming up in the campaign. Uh, and so, you know, if your DM allows you, you can now change out your skills and there's different ways of doing it. Um, that one doesn't shock me as much, but the next thing that you can do is kind of shocking. Yeah, that's changing your subclass. And, you know, this is something that's kind of weird uh, and it's specifically tailored, uh, you know, with with your DM's permission, you can when you would gain a new subclass feature. You can change your subclass. You know, there is a, you know, a gold cost or, you know, perform some kind of ritual or, you know, some kind of story driven element like, hey, I fell asleep beneath this special fey tree and, you know, I had dreams that were prophetic and, you know, towards divination. So now, as opposed to an enchanter, I wanted to become a diviner. And, you know, there you have it. So, like, you can technically work with your GM to, to do this. I know in, you know, one of our games uh, that, that we ran, Dave ran a Spelljammer campaign, and I was initially a, um, a great old one warlock, and I went with, uh, you know, the Celestial Warlock instead. It was far more fitting, but it after the game had already begun. But, you know, those kind of things can happen because... As new material comes out and you find something that feels like a better fit for your character that didn't exist before, you know, they are like, oh man, this is a lot of fun to play or this really fits my character. So getting into that, having that option, I think is great, you know, within the actual D&D rule set. Yeah, and all of these are very, very optional. You're going to have to run it by your GM and see if it's okay. Now, the next section we're going to go into is going to have a combination of yeah, they're more or less being added to the core book and, and less optional um, than the ones, the things that we just mentioned. But I mean, obviously, it, in D D, everything is kind of optional up to your dungeon master, especially when you're adding new books. So the next section is all about the new subclasses, uh, except for the artificer. Their artificer gets reprinted in here, and we get all the subclasses previously, as well as a new one. So that's worth mentioning. There's a total of 30 subclasses in, in this book. 
Now, seven of them happen to be, uh, you know, reprints from previous books. So, like, you know, your your artifacts or subclasses from Eberron that are in there, your two subclasses from Mythic Odysseys of Theros. Uh, you, you've got, you know, one from the, the Skag is even in there. So, uh, you know, if you're really into, you know, the elements of, uh, you know, Adventurers League, you know, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is really going to allow you to choose that and not have to worry about those things that were in those other books because it's so much easier to, to grab all of those options there. Yeah, and also for the folks that aren't familiar with the lingo, Skag is Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Uh, that's the Blade Singer, And it also gets a little tweaked. It's not in, in that book. It's like you must be elf or half elven. And now it's kind of opened up to other races. And it, so they changed that a little bit. Um, now, of those other 23 subclasses, it's not quite fair to say they're all new. Some of them, I'm sure, have been tweaked. We haven't gone through them all yet, but we've seen them all in Unearthed Arcana, right? So these are being reprinted from Unearthed Arcana. They've been play tested. Now they're, now they're official. Um, the other thing we're mentioning, every single class, except for the Artificer, has a best, uh, a special optional class feature section where if your DM allows it, you just get extra things added to your class. Sometimes it might just be something minor, like an expanded spell list, or you can swap out spells and cantrips more frequently than you used to before, or it might be something more specific um, that you is just an extra ability that you're going to get. Now, you know, we're not going to dive into all of those abilities, but if you'd like to see us, you know, break that down that's, you know, 12 classes. That would be a lot of videos. Uh, you know, please let us know whether that's something that you would have any interest of hearing our take on that. Uh, you know, there are some elements that we are going to get into, you know, uh, a little bit. And that is beyond those special customizations and the new subclasses. Some of the classes actually have some new features that are added. Like if you look at the fighter, there are some new you know, battle master maneuvers and some, some, you know, build guides, if you will. There's two other things that we, that we should mention. And uh, one of those for, for subclasses is Ranger. I know many people are going to be very excited to see that Ranger gets a little bit of a tweak, Ted. What, so, how are you feeling about this? All right. So we've got, you know, a section for Beastmaster companions. I know that, you know, there, there has been so much hate poured on the Beastmaster Ranger for so long, it's weak in every other companion-based class that's out there. The companion is superior in every way, shape, or form to you know what the ranger gets. So seeing this in here kind of kind of brings a, a a very big smile to my face because it's like, all right, you know, we're we're getting some love, we're getting some some uh, some options to really fix things. Yeah, yeah, we've seen and we've seen them before. They appeared in one of the Unearthed Arcana, and basically what you get as a beast companion, instead of summoning a specific animal, you summon the spirit, and it's going to be air, land, or sea. You basically get to make up what it looks like and, and what kind of beast it mimics. But, you know, depending on the type, that's the abilities it's going to get. And it does fix some of the problems with the beast companion. The biggest thing for me has always been the hit points. The other things I've been kind of like okay with. Um, but with that fix in the hit points, I, it really brings it up. But they, there's uh, some other areas where they get a little bit better. So we can expect that from the Ranger. Also, the Warlock gets, uh, gets a little more love as well. Yeah, we got some new invocations. And, you know, it's good to see these lists, you know, the Warlock gets invocations. And it's good to see this list to keep growing. Uh, because, you know, the Warlock for so long has just been, well, hello, Warlock. Cast Eldritch Blast. Thank you. Have a good day. Who's up next? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I'd go that far. Like there, there's been other invocations, but you know, uh, and we've gotten some here and there, but this is like, we're getting more, which is always good. Um, and to go along with the different patrons options we get as well. Uh, so again, we're not really seeing new stuff here with these player options because they've appeared on Unearthed Arcanas. Right. And, you know, we've we've discussed a lot of this material and now it's, you know, it's moved into the, you know, official or optional official, depending upon what you toggle on on D&D &D yeah. beyond uh, with all the different little red markers. So finally, in the player options, uh, chapter one, we bring to a close with feats. We're going to get 15 new feats. 15 new feats. You, you know what that means, guys. Yes, we've seen them all before in Unearthed Arcana. There's not really any surprises, surprises here. 
but now they're official, so you can add them to your character. So that's kind of cool. Lot, lots of fun. Anything that with with more options is just great. And you know, uh, character customization and character versatility, uh, you know, only adds to the fun elements. Of it. All right, Ted, are you ready to dive into chapter two? All right, chapter two, we're talking about patrons. Yeah, group patrons, right? Not you know, like your warlock patrons, but this is like. Hey, your adventuring party, they they work for somebody. This is the quest giver. Uh, and, you know, they have a bunch of different kinds that are going to be out there. They kind of also tell you how to make your own yeah, in I, addition to giving you a bunch of examples. Yeah, I think it's it's awesome. You know, there's so many different, uh, you know, groups out there that are playing more of the one shot style uh, where you've got a quest giver. Tonight's session, because we don't know who's going to be here next session, it's just this rolling format of, you know, start and end with tonight's adventure. And that falls very easily into having this patron and to have a format, you know, that's that's supported by the official material is is nice because we're seeing, you know, this this change in style away from, you know, oh, I go into a dungeon and I'm going to spend four or five sessions underground or in, you know, in this place before I get back to town. So yeah, I, and you're, you're, you're going to get some, you're, you're going to get some perks. They, they're going to give you assignments. Uh, even the example ones are really kind of cool. Like you've got an Academy, uh, ancient being crime syndicate, military force, sovereign. So, so, I mean, really there's more than that, but you know, they cover most of the things I think most players would maybe come up with and be like, oh, I want to work for this group or be a part of this organization. But then you can use, you know, the tools that are there and the examples that are provided. If you have something that's unique to your game that is going to step out, you know, away from it. Like, you know, there's nothing to say that, oh, your patron couldn't just be a dragon. Let's start the campaign a little bit, a higher level. You know, you guys all have this illustrious career beforehand, but somehow you have found yourself in the service of a dragon. So why not? Sure, let's go for it. And, you know, in all fairness, this this is the kind of stuff I feel a lot of us have been using in our games anyway. And, you know, Wizards of the Coast is just kind of codifying it and making it simpler, maybe for uh, newer GMs that aren't as experienced. So they can just kind of go in there and, and see how to do it and, and, you know, garner some ideas and inspiration for their games. You know, anything that makes it easier to GM, I'm all for. And that's one of the elements that I think is fantastic about, you know, all of the streaming games that are out there. Uh, you know, I think, I think you know, Wizards has understood where the game has gone and see what is drawing people in. And as you said, you know, bringing those tools to the new gamers to show, you know, how this game can be played within the supported material, I, I think is just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so that sums up chapter two. Next up is chapter three. Chapter three, we're talking about new spells, you know, magical miscellany. Uh, and, you know, we've got 21 spells within it. Uh, I, har I, you know, I hearken back to that word, new spells, yeah. uh, five of which are reprints, uh, four of which were cantrips from uh, Sword Coast Adventures Guide, as well as uh, a ninth level spell. Yeah, so like the so the breakdown for our spells are one first, uh, two second, five third, three fourth, one fifth, two sixth, one seventh, one ninth. Uh, five cantrips we kind of mentioned they're all reprints, um, which yeah it's all cool. Like more spells the better, and also there were some really cool spells that were introduced in Unearth Arcana, uh, all like summoning things. So like if you wanted to play a summoner, now you're gonna have a lot more options. Uh, but I think like even cooler than that is the personalizing spell section under the spells. Yeah, being able to kind of alter how your spell looks and acts visually, uh, you know, again, now makes it into, you know, the official material. I, I know most spellcasters that I, I have played or have existed in my games, I have always allowed, you know, that personalization. Uh, you know, I like characters who describe how they do their magic. And to, to see it represented, you know, oh, well, I'm a thunder-based spellcaster, so when, or thunder and lightning-based spellcaster, so when I cast my fireball, perhaps red streaks of lightning are going through it. It still is going to 100% act like a fireball. It's going to explode, it's going to do fire damage, but visually you can create your character thematically and have all of your spells function that way. 
Yeah, when, I mean, when I played my Uthangar uh, kind of war wizard in your campaign, my magic missiles were always described as whirling, uh, uh, you know, tiny hammers of force that would slam into our opponents. Like, we've been doing this kind of, this kind of stuff in our games for a while. But, you know, sometimes newer GMs just need, you know, that little extra nudge or permission to, to make some changes in the game and make it their own. And so I think it's nice that uh, Wizards is kind of like pointing it out and going, hey, look, you know, here are some things you can change. It doesn't really mean anything for mechanics. It's just the RP and the visuals, so, you know, so that your wizard, you know, if he, you know, maybe you're all about owls. So every spell you do has something that you cast fly and, you know, a magical, uh, you know, spectral owl picks you up and flies you around whatever you want it to be you know it's just like cool flavor but when, when you look at those elements those are the things that you know allow you to get into character more often it allows the the dm when they're creating an npc to be like all right how does this character's magic look and you can then kind of uh dictate you know what kind of things happen when you when you when that caster uses magic when they cast their spells and and the players might not know what is going on as their spell unleashes and it adds for a little bit more flair a little bit more drama and you know it's like oh well you describe the visuals oh is that something i want to counter spell or not i don't know what this is oh should i do it should i not you know yeah oh. <laughs> they have to like arcana to be like oh he just cast magic missile at me right <laughs> it's not a big deal yeah, you know, a counter spell versus a shield, very different, you know, spell usage when, you know, like, oh, it was just, you know, throwing hammers of force. I just cast shield and it stops it, whereas a counter spell to stop it is less effective. So uh, the last part of this section for chapter three is magic items. We get 46 new items and one, one of which is a reprint um, from the Eberron book, The Prosthetic Limb. Um, and we get we get a new category of magic items. Again, we say new, but um, a bunch of these we've seen already. But also, uh, unlike other sections of the book, uh, a lot of these magic items we haven't seen too. Like all the tattoos we've seen, right? And but some of these, but some of these are very specific to this book and and Tasha as well. So eleven of those are are the tattoos that we saw in you know the unearthed arcana. Uh, it, it's it is clear that you know. Many people within the D&D community want to see magic tattoos. Uh, I still find it odd that I can I can pick up my quill and put the, the magic tattoo on me, or I can take that quill and suck the tattoo out and put it on somebody else. But it still has to function like a typical D&D magic item. Uh, so that's how they want to do it. In your game, if you want to have it, it's one use. Once it's on, it's on. And that's just how it goes. Feel free. It is your game after all. Uh, but it's just it's just fun to see that new category, that new uh, item or element added. We get a lot of wizard love in the magic item section. There's a bunch of tomes that are really just literally spell books, but they're enchanted spell books. So they might have a short list of spells that are always in them. You can use it like a spell book, meaning you can put more spells in it. But then you can also use it as a arcane focus. And oftentimes there's other things that you can do with it. They have charges. And usually like there's two options that you can do, like maybe one of them might be re spend a charge, regain a spell slot for a specific school of magic, and the other one might be kind of an effect that's specific to that school of magic. So, you know, I like that. That's, pre that's pretty cool. Yeah, you, you see so often in artwork and even in minis these days where the, the wizard is standing there, you know, with the tome open and, you know, enacting magic, like, I'm sorry, that is just evocative. So, yeah, I I'm... You're Dude, you're just like so badass. You're like, I am just going to beat your ass with this book. All right. <laughs> so like, yeah, it's definitely a lot of fun, uh, you know, to have the wizard being able to employ their spell book as a focus, uh, you know. Yo, going back to customizing your spells, like do a tensor's floating disc that's basically just a lectern. Um, and you just set your, you know, set your enchanted arcane tome upon that uh, and just like hands free it i thought you were gonna say that it was a uh you know just a giant open book that you're standing on <laughs> uh, well i mean you could go that route as well but you know i was thinking the map so the breakdown of our magic items are four common 12 uncommon 19 rare five very rare one legendary and five artifacts so if you needed more magic items you're definitely getting them you know so that, that's you know this this book is very heavily 
driven in the player options and customization type stuff. I know magic items, people wonder, like, you know, where does that fall? Is that a DM thing or a player thing? But they're Why supposed, not both? They're, they're supposed to be given out to the players, so I feel it's it falls onto that spectrum, but, you know, it's definitely a lot of fun things that are in that book. And, you know, I haven't read them all. It is def- definitely something that I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of fun things in there that I'm looking forward to putting out into, into my games. There is an awesome cauldron in there that druids and uh, warlocks can use as as a as a folk spellcasting focus. Is it? And it Tasha's starts off as a little, of everything. Uh, it, no, <laughs> but it starts off as a little a little basically like pot that can grow big enough to hold a midi- medium creature, and it's got some other cool things like making a healing potion, burying somebody a corpse in there and saw and bringing them back with raised dead. Yeah. Cool magic items. What do we got next? All right. So, you know, I just, you know, touted about how how this book is, you know, clearly driven for the players. But chapter four is actually, you know, all for the dungeon master. We've got a whole section on session zero and sidekicks, you know, and it just, you know, goes on and on. All things to, you know, help, you know, build the DM's toolbox. If Yeah. So, all right. Session zero. We're big fans of that. We've talked about it over and over again. It goes through the different parts of Session Zero. This is going to be super useful for DMs that maybe never heard of it. Maybe they've never been on YouTube and they've never looked at, you know, a YouTuber is talking about it. Sidekicks, we've seen that in several different places now. We've seen it on Arthur Canna. And then it went into, I believe it was the Essentials um, Adventure Kits. It was kind of cool. Uh, Then we've got this parlaying with monster section. It's so cool, right? Because it kind of says like, oh, what kind of checks should you use if you're using skills for the parlay, but then it also goes, well, if you're trying to convince them and bribe them based on their type, what should you bring? Like aberrations. One of the things is like an organ or brain or something. Right. So there's like cool tidbits like that. Supernatural regions, uh, which is just going to be cool adventuring sites that you can add for exploration. Uh, We also have, magical phenomena and that is just stuff going on like i don't know a colony of mimics or something uh but then it goes on from there you've got natural hazards you've got puzzles you know things that are supposed to you know stump and thwart your players you know and and really like there are not there's never going to be enough things about hazards and puzzles in my opinion because once you put it out there the players are gonna see it they're gonna grab it and they're gonna know so like you know, the, the DMs need as many, you know, tips and tricks. Uh, and it is definitely a, a thing that I falter on. Uh, and, and I need I need every resource I can I can grab in this area because I know that the players that I game with, they're veterans. They've seen just about everything, if not everything that's out there. And they're getting the same damn books I am, too. So it's like, ah! Yeah, I mean, the, the natural hazard section, they have this cool chart that just lists a bunch of you know, naturally occurring things. Mm-hmm. And then in addition to that, it has a spell that correlates it to the game. So like, if you want to do this natural hazard, just use this spell to kind of, uh, you know, mimic the mechanics. So all in all, this was a great book. This is a good buy. Uh, we want to thank Wizards of Coast for sending us a couple of copies, at least one of which is going to go into our Patreon rewards pile. So if you're a patron, you know, or if you, you know, go over to our website and you've kind of fill out the, our, our monthly contest thing, you're able to, you know, uh, get an entry that way, but our patrons are automatically entered. Uh, so, you know, Tasha's Cauldron and everything, there will be at least one copy in that pile uh, in the future. All in all, I'm happy with this book. What do you think, Ted? Absolutely. I'm, I'm loving it. I, you know, I wish I had more time to just, you know, dive in and, and read cover to cover, uh, you know, downside for sure is with, you know, 30 subclasses or, you know, if you want to count 23, uh, I just don't play enough games to be able to play them all. So, uh, you know, that, that part I'm sure we're going to dive into some more though, as time goes on. Indeed. If you're looking for more official D&D books reviewed by us, then you might want to check out our overview of Mythic Odysseys of Theros over here. If you need even more 5e content in your life, check out Nerdarchy Patreon, where we make content for players and DMs alike. But that's not all we do. We've got monthly fan games, giveaways, as Dave mentioned, that, you know, happen every month, and our patrons automatically get in, entered in, and more. So until next time, stay Stay nerdy. nerdy.